thank you all again for joining us for tonight's screening of The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. I'm Megan Rust. I'm the Interpretation Director at the Fresh Start Museum. Um, and before we begin, I just wanted to let you know that we do have closed captioning available for our film introduction this evening. You'll see a closed caption CC button at the bottom of your screen. You can click that to turn on the live transcript if you'd like to do so. And we'll begin with the land acknowledgement. The Frist Art Museum's building sits on land that Cherokee, Shawnee, and Yuchi Native peoples and elders call their ancestors or call their ancestors, excuse me, and their ancestors call their homelands. We acknowledge and pay respect to them. We also acknowledge and offer deep gratitude to the ancestral land and water that support us. And our film screening tonight is presented in conjunction with the exhibition Creating the American West in Art, which is on view in our upper level galleries through June 27th. We hope you'll come see it in person. It's a stunning exhibition and we'll look at a few of the works tonight during Sarah, Sarah Childress's introduction. Creating the American West in Art was organized by the Petrie Institute of Western American Art at the Denver Art Museum. The Frist Art Museum gratefully acknowledges our supporters for the exhibition, the Silver Supporter, the, the Sandra Shatton Foundation, and the Spanish translation sponsor, Vanderbilt University Center for Latin American Studies. And as always, we're grateful for the continued operating support from the Frist Foundation, Metro Nashville Arts Commission, Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts. We'll begin our evening with an introduction to the film by Dr. Sarah Childress. It'll be about 15 minutes or so. Um, and after this, after the introduction, we'll, fill, we'll screen the film, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance at the watch link. Um, I shared this link in your reminder email that you should have received one hour before um, we began this evening. So around six o'clock, I'll also put a link in the chat and you'll click that link and then you'll enter a passphrase um, that will start the film. And I'll share this passphrase at the end of our introduction. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Childress. Dr. Childress has taught film courses at Vanderbilt University, Bedoin College and Belmont University and has introduced films and moderated discussions at the Belcourt Theater, the Nashville Film Festival and Vanderbilt's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, in addition to at the Frist. She's helped establish the International Lens Film Series and produced a film, Musica Campesina. Did I say that right, Sarah? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Musica <laughs> Campesina, that's close. Enough. Great. Which screened international, internationally at renowned film festivals, including the Film Society of Lincoln Center's Latin Beat Festival, the Buenos Aires International Festival of Independent Cinema and the Mill Valley Film Festival. Her short film, Blue Dragon Muscle Wagon has exhibited internationally as well. And currently she's partnering with the Belcourt Theater to develop a cinema studies curriculum for high school students. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Childress. Yay, thank you so much, Megan. I'm so happy to be here. And um, I'm, I'm going to impose a little bit on everyone's uh, evening because I'm gonna to try to keep this as close to 15 minutes as I can, but I'm so used to standing in front of a big screen in front of a big audience who I know is just there like, oh, you know, TikTok goes o'clock, I'm here to watch the film. So I've taken a little bit of liber liberty, haha, -ha, <laughs> for tonight and have made, um, I've gone a little bit crazy. I kind of got the bit between my teeth since we're talking about Westerns and kind of ran for it. And um, so you can turn me off at any moment and go watch the film. But I did want to, to give a sense, not only of John Ford Westerns, but the idea of the Western hero and to set us up not only for this film, but also for some of the themes in the exhibition. And then we'll be screening another film next month, Meek's Cutoff. And that's something um, that I think tonight will kind of carry over and I'll be doing the introduction for that as well. So uh, very quickly, Creating the American West Exhibition showcases works from 1822 to 1946. And that's what's currently at the Frist right now. 
And it does that to consider the various styles and themes participating in the conception of the American West. Now, I wanted to take that and say, okay, what I'm dealing with tonight isn't just about the conceptualization of the American West, but the conceptualization of America, because Westerns, whether we're dealing with Westerns in any kind of art, painting, bronzes, film, stories, pulp, fiction, whatever, really involves the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves as Americans. Because the United States, if, if we remember, is a post-colonial country. And we won political independence from Britain, but winning political independence is very much different from winning kind of, winning kind of cultural independence. So even after we won political independence, we were still struggling to distinguish ourselves as a distinctive nation. Because a country is a place but really a nation is an idea. And I'm sort of going off of Benedict Anderson's idea that a nation is an imagined community created by the people who consider themselves or believe themselves to be a part of that community. And the stories that we tell are very important in terms of, of establishing that idea of the nation. So the West was very much central to our conceptualiz conceptualization of the nation. I'm so glad, Megan, who thank you so much, put this wonderful slide presentation together. And I chose this particular painting, Thomas Moran's Sunset Green River Butte, because its aspect ratio, which is a film situation, um, like a, is a film turn, but its aspect ratio and its landscapes very much resemble that of John Ford. So you can see here in 1915, Ford gets started in 1917. So we're dealing with very uh, similar kind of landscapes here. So the West was fundamental to our creation of our sense of the nation because as a location, I mean, you can see this just incredible landscape. As a location, the West is one of our most distinguishing features as a country. It's one of the things that makes us exceptional. And yes, I chose that word very specifically in terms of American exceptionalism. And so it makes sense that the West would be the location and the locus for our determination of who we are as a nation. So, uh, within this mythology and within this particular place, we have the conception of a whole series of kind of mythological tropes, but also particular archetypes. And here we have the idea of the Western hero springing from this landscape. So Megan, if you wouldn't mind um, moving to Trail Boss because Trail Boss is such a great evocation of that Western hero and also part of our uh, exhibition. So in the classical conception of the Western hero, he, yes, as a, as a woman, <laughs> I just want to say, yeah, usually the Western hero is, no, okay, pretty much always the Western hero is a man. He is a white Euro American man, and he is a competent, moral, and individual. So when, when I use the word competent, I don't mean it in the way it's like, you know, condemning with faint praise, where it's like, oh, competency. Competent means that you are able to do everything that needs to be done. And the trail boss, this image here, is such a wonderful evocation of the Western hero because you have this wonderful kind of slightly low angle view. You have a larger than life character who, even though the background is filled with other elements, he is the primary um, focus of our attention. He's looking backwards, which of course, 1920, that would put us kind of more into the nostalgic moment where you're looking back into the past, which is kind of important for liberty balance, but looking back into the past and the strength of our history and our understanding of who we are and who we were. But, but you see, he's a larger than life figure. He's leading, he is the trail boss, he's the boss, and he's leading a group of people and cattle to safety and to their destination. So that's what I mean by competency, like in charge and also responsible. So there's a sense of a moral mission that's folded into this as well. And also the idea of rugged individualism, which we see him very much individualized, individuated from the rest of the really just background wallpaper, for lack of a better word, behind him. He is the Western hero. And so now, uh, Megan, if you don't mind, if we go to the, um, to the Maynard Dixon, perfect, excellent. Another wonderful um, wide angle landscape uh, that very much evokes what we're talking about uh, or what we'll be looking at in John Ford films, especially the later films. 
But to continue on with the idea of the Western hero, here we see the Western hero in a larger context. So the Western hero is of the West and at home in the West. And so usually the Western heroes don't come from the East. They're usually born in the West and very much uh, feel at home there. They are really a part of the land. They can navigate it. They can live off of it. They, they leverage it for their, their way of life. But they're, they're almost a part of the landscape, a part of the place, as well as leveraging its natural resources. So they make good and proper use of it, which of course is part of Manifest Destiny. But this is why the West is often identified not just as a wilderness, but also as an Eden, a kind of garden. So the West is, is both a place of danger, but also purification and possibility. So wilderness, but also an Eden. Also, the Western hero balances within himself this quintessentially Western tension between wilderness and civilization. And so clearly, we know that these people, these writers, their recent, <laughs> their recent additions to the landscape, they're displacing people who originally lived there. And yes, horses we know in the West were brought by the Spanish conquistadors. So everything about this particular painting is actually a, a involves displacement though we don't see it because one of the things that we think about with the West is that it's an empty landscape that needs to be filled. And the Western hero fills the landscape because they know, he knows it's right and proper use. So he's bringing civilization, but at the same time, not too much civilization, a particular kind of, set of civilization, which involves the good and proper use of the natural landscape of the resources. Um, and so in addition to um, the civilization wilderness as place-based, there's also an honor-based moral code and there's a self-actualization by a violence because the West, again, is a wilderness, is a very violent and scary place. And so it's important that the, the man who is going to dominate and domesticate the wild is also very proficient in the use of violence because he has to usher in the domination and domestication of these wild spaces, for sure, in order to properly make use of them. So now I wanna go into a very uh, brief back, well, kind of, hopefully it will be a very brief background of some of the films of John Ford because he's very much coming into and, um, and speaking with, because I love these dates are like completely coming because I, I, I wanna deal with some of his major films. And John Ford comes to Hollywood. He actually follows his brother there. They're, they're from Maine, actually. And when I taught at Bowdoin, I would go to Portland, Maine, and there's actually a statue of John Ford because he was born in Cape Elizabeth, just south of Portland. But his brother of 12 years, who's 12 years older than him, goes out to Hollywood. He follows him and basically becomes indispensable. And so he makes his first film as a director in 1917. It's called The Tornado, and it's a Western. And he makes films for almost, he makes Westerns for almost 50 years with his last um, Western being Cheyenne Autumn in 1964. So a couple of highlights, um, films that I wanna mention that John Ford did. First one is Stagecoach in 1931. That was um, really the sort of the shot heard around the world in terms of Westerns. Not so much because it becomes the quintessential classical Western, but because it makes Westerns a se serious films. I mean, I, I don't know for, for if any, <laughs> for those of you who were here earlier hearing me chatting about monster films and like genre films in general and how deep they can be, Stagecoach was one of the first films to show that Westerns aren't just horse operas or kitty B movie matinees or singing cowboys, that they can actually be very serious films about very serious themes and, and, and ideas. And so, and, and Stagecoach comes on the scene. It's almost like a chamber drama, which is gonna be important when we're talking about Liberty Balance. And by that, I mean, you have some wonderful scenes like this one, Maynard Dixon's, where you have these, these uh, beautiful exteriors, but a lot of the action ha happens in interiors because, well, the film's called Stagecoach and a lot of what happens is within the stagecoach. And what we see is nation building. So it's a group of disparate people who, who put their individual interests aside in order to gather together against a singular threat. 
which just so happens to be Geronimo. So again, this is very much about a displacement. So we're again hearing mythologization and history from a very specific perspective. And we get the Ringo Kid, which is one of John Wayne's early and most prominent roles. And he adds something to my earlier evocation of the Western hero, which is innocence. Because John Wayne's character, the Ringo Kid, embodies all the things that, that I was talking about. He's very competent. He's, he uses violence. And in this case, he's avenging. And vengeance is definitely usually a subplot or a major plot of most Western films. But, but beyond that, he's just a good guy. Like he's a good man. He's just trying to do the best he can. He was raised right. And he's just trying to kind of live by his particular code. So there's a kind of innocence there. In addition to the, to the nation building, you could say it's also kind of a naivete or an ignorance that's, that's blindness. And that's something that will <laughs> later become an issue when we move into the later films of John Ford. But that's Stagecoach. Now I want to talk about My Darling Clementine, which is 1946, and it's important to pay attention to the date, 1946, because it is a revisionist Western, and it, well, it's, it's a very, it's, no, it's not a revisionist Western. It is an evocation of the classical Western that is nevertheless informed by what happens in World War II, because World War II, as you may know, gave rise to a number of new film genres, including film noir. But My Darling Clementine is a wonderful kind of updating of the classical Western hero. So it, it does what Westerns do. It dramatizes a Western le legend, which is the shootout at the OK Corral. It relies, too, on the Western central opposition of civilization versus wilderness. But what it does is wilderness is now more a matter of white men's souls than it is a matter of landscape or the Native American inhabitants of that landscape. The savagery becomes integrated within not so much the heroes, but within the, the villains. They become much more obviously savage. Um, it also imagines the birth of the nation. And I use that term very pointedly because Birth of a Nation is a terrible film for many ways, but what it's trying to imagine is a reunification of the nation through the bonding of North and South. And my darling Clementine imagines a nation through the bonding of East and West, that there's actually a way to bring these two, um, these two spaces together and unify the country by doing that. And it does it through the romance between Clementine, who is <laughs> very much of the East, you know, sophisticated, cultured school marm, um, and our wonderful Western hero here, Wyatt Earp, played by Henry Fonda. Uh, and it also continues to, through Henry Fonda's character of Wyatt Earp, delineate the Western hero through not only updating it through kind of a post-World War II lens, but also doing it by contrasting Wyatt Earp with another character, Doc Holliday. So if you've seen Clementine, My Darling Clementine, you know um, Doc Holliday played by Victor Mature. He's widely res respected for his skills as a gunfighter, uh, his mastery of violence and, of and his use of it to defend his honor and the honor of others is something that he's very well respected for. But, <laughs> but he's also obviously a man of the East. He's college educated, a doctor who quotes Shakespeare, He's a fashionable dresser who drinks champagne rather than whiskey. And he makes his living as a professional gambler rather than using or leveraging the natural resources of the West. And this is one of the things I think is so interesting. He embodies the East and European culture, which like him are seen to suffer from a wasting disease because Doc Holliday in real life and in the film is dying from tuberculosis. But in, the, in real life, he dies in 36, at the age of 36 in his bed, but in the film, he goes down in a blaze of glory, sacrificing himself for his brothers in arms. For those of you who know the OK Corral, this is not a spoiler alert. But what is interesting is not only is the wasting disease he's put on Doc Holliday and also Eastern and European culture, but Doc Holliday is also feminized because that's one of the things that's so interesting is that civilization is seen as feminized. Like it's okay for women to bring in culture and education and um, you know the finer things in life because, well, 
their girls and the gentle, the gentle arts are something that will help, help gentle the West, but it's not really the proper place or the proper um, use of masculine talents is this kind of, um, you know, education and, and culturization. And that's important to remember for Liberty Balance. So I just wanted to underscore that. Feminized characters, that's not really a good thing in Westerns, usually in the traditional Western which is why it's important in Liberty Balance. So that's Doc Holliday, but Wyatt Earp in contrast is very much a man of the West. He's a well-known law enforcer, famous for getting his man. Though in the film, he's a former law enforcer. He makes a point of saying he's an ex-marshal. He's now really a cowboy and a rancher who works with his brothers, but he gets back into law enforcement essentially to fulfill one of the usual plot devices of the Western, which is revenge or vengeance is probably even more important because there's a kind of Old Testament honor code idea that happens in Westerns, which is, you know, an eye for an eye. And that's the idea of justice, because in a lawless land, you have to create. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, sorry, I'm running. I'm running long. So I'll, I'll be quick. But you, you know, you have to kind of create law for yourself. Um, so Earp embodies not only this kind of, you know, trying to create law in a lawless land, but he's also uh, embodying a post-war notion of competency. He's a little bit world weary and melancholy burdened by the violence that he's seen. And so we can, we can guess that maybe that's why he's no longer a marshal, um, but it makes him into a different person. He's not hair triggered he's, uh, or swaggering. There's no need for him to prove himself. He's much more strategic and patient. He's skilled in using violence, but he only uses it when he needs to. He's also a solitary figure who's a natural leader, but he wouldn't say that he's a natural leader. He's just like one of the guys. And it just so happens that, that this kind of organic meritocracy raises him to the top and other people around him see him as a leader and so kind of put him in that position, also important for liberty balance. So moving right along, 10 years after My Darling Clementine, we get to The Searchers, which is one of the earliest revisionist Westerns. And so revisionist Westerns is a name we give to Westerns that are searching, <laughs> really very much like The Searchers. They're searching, they're questioning, while most classical Westerns revere and rely on myth rather than history even though the myths are grounded in history, revisionist Westerns integrate particular aspects of US history into their narratives to reflect on how our history has made us who we are. So arguably revisionist Westerns are a byproduct of one of my favorite subgenres, which are psychological Westerns. And psychological Westerns start to appear right around the time of My Darling Clementine, 1946. And these films explore the complex inner lives and traumas of the Western hero, who's no longer just an avatar or bringer of manifest destiny into the West, but a human being. And a human being who has seen and done terrible things, even if they've done it for a higher cause. So Jimmy Stewart is actually uh, plays, he, he teams up with Anthony Mann and he plays a lot of those kind of complex um, Western heroes in the psychological Westerns. He was a major presence there. So he plays kind of obsessive, neurotic, barely stable heroes who try to enact justice. So hero and justice now has to be in like air quotes and like winking air quotes. Um, his, their missions aren't always just and they barely seem to survive them leaving not stronger and purified but severely weakened and self-questioning if not self-hating. Like one of my favorites is The Naked Spur which I love to watch anytime I can get my hands on it. So going to the searchers, the searchers, uh, and for those of you who have seen it know, explicitly addresses racism and genocide in the US history. So our protagonist, Ethan Edwards, who we see here, uh, John Wayne in many ways epitomizes the Western hero. He's skillful, I mean, he has deep competency. He's uh, very experienced, he has this great experiential knowledge. He seems to know everything. He seems like he can do everything, but the one thing he can't do is control his racism, which is really vicious. Though vengeance in the story seems to motivate his actions, it's actually racism that is his true motivation. So his double in the film is Scar, a Comanche chief who hates whites in equal measure. Both men have lost loved ones to the violence of the other. 
Though the film begins with a Comanche raid involving murder, rape, and kidnapping at the Edwards homestead, as the film continues, you see US cavalry raids on peaceful native villages and the murders of native women and children. So here we see the Western hero is capable of cold-blooded murder. Violence is an expression of hate rather than justified vengeance. And you can't really see, and I kind of made this purposeful, but in Ethan's right hand is the scalp of Scar. And so it just goes to show that that savagery is firmly embedded within the, the heart of this particular hero. So now at last, and I'll make this really quick, the man who shot Liberty Valance. So from the very beginning, the film signals its difference from other Ford films. While most Ford films open with expansive landscape shots, usually in Monument Valley, and the introduction of the hero within these large spaces, like we saw in the Maynard Dixon painting, Liberty Valance begins with a shot of a train. And the iron horse has supplanted the horse, and the frontier is now settled. And so when we see our hero, he looks like a very different kind of hero. And there you, you see Jimmy Stewart. He's the self-important Senator Rant Stoddard. And you see him at the very beginning, he's kind of like puffing up his chest and you know, just, yes, I'm Senator and I'm amazing and awesome and whatever. So he isn't a Western hero in the legendary sense, but <laughs> he is a storyteller which makes him perhaps even more powerful than the Western hero. He is the man behind the curtain in a sense. So he is a mythologizer. And notice throughout the film how his power comes from his verbal abilities. So this is what we call Liberty Balance, is what we call a chamber Western. I mentioned that in Stagecoach. Most of the action you'll see takes place in interiors like restaurants, schoolrooms, newspaper offices, a local convention. And the exteriors we see look like backlot selves, like backlot sets. But these artifice and these interiors constantly remind us of what this film is, which is a dramatization. And that's something very important to remember as you're watching the film. On the surface, because it's a frame narrative, it's reenacting memories as told by our hero here, Rance Stoddard, Jimmy Stewart. But I think it's more about active mythologization. I think this film is about Rance's attempt to reconceive the Western hero. And what this means is the film shows us there's a clear disconnect between narrative and fact. Or we can think about history as variable. It's subjective. It's based on who's telling the story and from what perspective. And if we can see our, our next and final slide, which is, and I, I love it. It's like, again, there's this wonderful like tripod, this, this, tri, this triumvirate, not only at the beginning when Rance is talking to the two newspaper guys who want to hear his story, but now we have Liberty Valance played by um, Lee Marvin, amazingly John Wayne, who is Tom Donovan and Senator Rance Sutter. You have here the old West in the foreground and the new West in the background, and they are all very much connected. So uh, the tension, let's see, I'm just gonna skip that. In Rance's retelling in the beginning, you'll see a familiar contrast like the one between Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday. John Wayne's character, Tom Donovan, is akin to Earp, the traditional Western hero. He's wise, skilled in violence, but uses it only when necessary. A dedicated rancher now established enough to settle down and strong enough to show some vulnerability. While Rance seems to extend Doc's Eastern ideal as seen through the Western lens. He's educated, eloquent, professional, values the law, he's a lawyer, brings education to the community and helps move the territory towards statehood. Though he's initially seen and seemingly portrayed with the weaknesses of civilization, he is feminized. He still represents the same kind of honor code as the traditional Western hero. So as you hear him tell his story or see his story being told, his story actively works to transform those weaknesses into strengths which would seem to be a necessary displacement of the old ways in this modern age of trains and phones and statehood where new forms of power, power that lies in words rather than guns, overwrites the old forms. After all, what is law and the practice of law, but the weaponization of words, of narratives. So Rance ushers in or tries to a new form of power, but he does th so through election. The old Western heroes, namely Tom Donovan, elect him, pass the baton to him, or so he says. But the film clearly questions, and this is my final thing, the film clearly questions this kind of legendary hero and the creation of heroes through legends and stories. It seems to yearn instead 
for something that was real or something that was also a figment of our imagination, which is the classical Western hero. So the man who shot Liberty Valance is not just a revisionist Western. There are many critiques in the edge of the film, but it's also a nostalgic one. When it's all said and done, people admire the man who shot Liberty Valance and believes there's a lot in that man to admire, perhaps because the fact of him is no longer the issue. That's it. You've been so patient. It's fantastic. You've been fantastic. Thank you.